Hi, welcome back to PC Builder. I'm Jason. The GPU market absolutely sucks, but can the Ryzen 5600G with its integrated graphics get you through to happier times? Today we're going to go through everything that you need to know to make the best Ryzen 5600G gaming build. From the best motherboards for Ryzen 5600G to the best memory for Ryzen 5600G, overclocking the integrated GPU, what size PSU should you include in your build for the future, and more. Then we're going to put together a $530 Ryzen 5600G gaming build and test it out with both integrated graphics and with a dedicated GPU against a Ryzen 5 5600X to see whether or not this is the upgrade for you. If you get value of this video, please remember, give it a like. It really helps out the channel. And of course, subscribe and click the bell icon. That way you get notified when we release new content. With that, let's jump into it. Let's briefly go over the differences between the Ryzen 5 5600G APU and the Ryzen 5 5600X CPU so that you understand the trade-offs. In a nutshell, the Ryzen 5 5600G is basically a cut-down Ryzen 5600X that has half the L3 cache in exchange for adding seven Vega integrated graphics cores. While the 5600G does run slightly faster at the base frequency, it also has a lower boost frequency than the 5600X. The other big difference, and you can decide if this is a deal breaker for you, is that the Ryzen 5 5600G does not support the faster PCIe Gen 4 speeds and is limited to PCIe Gen 3. Now, personally, I don't see the PCIe 3 limitation as very significant for gaming, as that speed difference is really only matters a tiny bit for graphics cards like the RX 6900 XT or RTX 3090, and Gen 4 SSDs don't have any gaming benefits over PCIe 3 SSDs. And let's face it, if you had the stacks of cash needed to buy one of those high-end GPUs, you probably wouldn't be considering the Ryzen 5600G in the first place. Of course, I think it is worth talking about other options in the current market when considering the Ryzen 5 5600G. Now, right now in most markets, you can buy an in-stock Radeon RX 6600 or 6600 XT for about $400 to $600. In fact, right now, Newegg US has both the RX 6600 and 6600 XT in stock, as it has since each of those GPUs launched, for between $500 and $800 in a motherboard combo. Though, in my recent polls, I definitely heard loud and clear from the community that many of you don't want to buy an AMD GPU and a lot of you are looking for something higher end than the RX 6600 and 6600 XT. Now let's take a look at the best motherboards for Ryzen 5600G. While the fact it lacks PCIe Gen 4 is a limitation, it could also save us quite a bit of money. Rather than going with a more expensive B550 or X570 board, we can instead pick up a very nice B450 board at a significant discount. I would caution you that you will likely need to get one with BIOS flashback as many boards do not yet ship with Ryzen 5600G ready BIOS out of the box. Luckily, most MSI B450s came with BIOS flashback and ASUS has recently released updated versions of their most popular B450s with BIOS flashback. For micro ATX motherboards, I'd recommend either the ASUS Tough Gaming B450M Plus 2 or the MSI Bazooka Max Wi-Fi. For more full-featured motherboards, including high-end audio codecs, I'd recommend the ASUS Tough Gaming B450 Plus 2, which I picked up for only $82 at Amazon, the ASUS ROG Strix B450F2, or the MSI B450 Gaming Pro Carbon Max Wi-Fi if you want maximum features. Links, of course, are down in the description. Now let's move on to the memory. Now this is pretty simple. In testing, Others have found that you want to get at least 3200 CL16 memory, and there is a lot of benefit to increasing memory speeds unless you're willing to shell out the money for 4 by 8 gigabyte kit of DDR4 4000 CL16. And if you are, then stop watching this video right now and just use that extra money to go buy a graphics card with the Ryzen 5 5600X. For everybody else, it's not worth the money to get anything other than 16 gigabytes of 3200 CL16. I picked up this kit for $67, but there are cheaper kits all the way down to only about $50 right now. But what about the power supply? Without a graphics card, this PC build isn't going to need much power at all. But of course, you want to leave yourself room to add in a graphics card later. Now, as I have this build spec'd out right now, it only needs 150 watts of power. Even if we use my usual formula of multiplying the max draw by 1.5, that's only 225 watts of power. Instead, if we were to put an RTX 3060 Ti inside 
and still using the safety multiplier, we would need a 550 watt or higher PSU. An RTX 3070 would need somewhere between a 650 watt and 700 watt PSU, and an RTX 3080 would like to see at least a 750 watt PSU. Now see my best power supply 2021 video for more info, including how to buy one that doesn't explode. Today we're gonna go with the MSI A650GF. I will leave a link in the description to some more budget appropriate options. What about cooling the Ryzen 5 5600G? Now you can absolutely use the included box cooler or spend between 20 and $40 on an aftermarket air cooler. Now personally, I'd get the budget air cooler and I've linked several down in the description. Today we're gonna to be using the id Cooling SE224 XT, a very capable budget air cooler I picked up on Amazon for only $25. For storage, I'm going with a 500 terabyte Western Digital SN550. Now remember, our CPU does not have PCIe Gen 4. And for gaming, there's really no difference between even a slower SATA SSD and the fastest PCIe Gen 4 drives. So this is a great budget compromise for less than $50. Finally, for the case, I decided to go with what I consider the best budget build case in the Zalman S2. It's got great airflow, three included fans, a tempered glass side panel, and comes in all black. The best thing is it costs only $52 from Amazon. Yes, it's got cheap build quality, it's a tight fit behind the side panel for cable management, and it lacks the nice features of more expensive cases, but you can't beat it for the price. As an alternative that doesn't cost much more, look at the Fantex P360A. Okay, let's roll the music and get this thing built. Let's take a look at how the integrated Vega graphics perform in three titles at 1080p and lower resolutions. Now starting off with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, with the lowest settings used on 1080p, we get a 33 FPS average. Dropping down to 1600 by 900 gives us a very playable and surprisingly decent looking experience at 42 FPS. Going down to 1024 by 768 does yield 60 FPS, however, the visual quality starts feeling like you're playing on a PlayStation 2. Borderlands 3 at the lowest settings in 1080p gives us a 37 FPS average, but our 1% lows do suffer a little bit here, dropping down to 22. At 1280x720, the lowest resolution the game will use, the experience is massively improved to 64 FPS average and 40 for the 1% lows. Given the comic book art style of the game, this setting actually looks really good. Jumping over to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and we can see that at either 1080p or 720p, the lowest resolution it'll use, the integrated graphics really does struggle even at the lowest settings, which only got us 33 FPS at 720p. Of course, you can overclock the Vega integrated graphics and should be able to do this through Ryzen Master. Unfortunately, I spent quite a bit of time trying to get Ryzen Master to work and it absolutely refused to do so. So I resorted to using the BIOS overclocking feature, which isn't as user friendly. I finally settled on the extreme iGPU overclocking preset in the ASUS BIOS, which pushed the iGPU from its base frequency of 1900 megahertz all the way up to 23 megahertz. 
Now I have seen others with stable overclocks up to 25 megahertz, so you may be able to squeeze out a little more performance with some more tinkering. Retesting in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p gained us four FPS for a 12% overall boost. Nothing earth shattering, but certainly easy and free performance from the auto overclocking feature. Of course, the big sticking point with the 5600G is what happens when you actually do get a dedicated graphics card. How much performance are you giving up in the long term in order to build something right now? Other outlets tested with high-end GPUs like the RTX 3080 and RTX 3090 at 1080p and found the 5600G to be about 15% slower than the 5600X with one of those high-end GPUs. While that might approximate a planned upgrade in the future, it feels maybe a little unrealistic for the audience of the 5600G. So I tested it with an RTX 3060 Ti, a GPU that's more in the higher mid-tier and represents something that I think will likely come down in price much faster than those flagship GPUs once the GPU crisis comes to an end. My testing in Shadow of the Tomb Raider showed that the Ryzen 5600X with an RTX 3060 Ti outpacing the 5600G by just about 10% at 1080p with no difference at 1440p. I did expect to see some performance difference, so I went back and reran these results, and yeah, it uh, it appears that at least for this game, there wasn't a difference with a GPU at 1440p highest settings. In Borderlands 3, we see a similar 10% difference at 1080p, and just to make things confusing, a 12% difference at 1440p. So overall, I think that we can guesstimate that based on the game you play and the GPU you end up with, you're leaving somewhere between 10% and 15% performance behind versus the 5600X. So should you build a Ryzen 5600G gaming PC now? Well, if you only have $530 and you just need something to get gaming, I really think that the 5600G makes a lot of sense as a low-end gaming PC that at some point could slot in a used GPU. That's similar to what the 3400G used to be. If you're somebody who's looking to spend in the neighborhood of $1,000 to $1,400 though, I really think you should pick up a Radeon RX 6600 or 6600 XT. I know a lot of you are out there are on the Nvidia or bus train, but I would urge you to reconsider. Now, of course, if you are all in on an Nvidia RTX 3060 Ti or 3070, but the market's just too much for you, then yes, the Ryzen 5600G would make a lot of sense to build now, enjoy easy to play games at good frame rates and AAA titles at lower resolutions. That just might be the way to go. Remember, of course, if you got value in this video, please do give it a like as it makes a big difference to the channel. And of course, if you want to check out my recent Ryzen 5600X gaming build as a comparison, you can click this video right here for more, including the full parts list, the build, and the gaming benchmarks. And of course, I'll see you on the next one.